color in matter, painting out of color. In the realm of color, we have made a distinction between those colors, black, white, green, and peach blossom, which we recognize from their qualities as image, and those colors which I have described as having a luster quality, blue, yellow, and red. We have seen how these have a kind of inner individual will by virtue of their shining, gleaming quality. As you know, we can perceive color in the so-called spectrum colors, in the rainbow, where we see color as color and also in the color of material objects. And when we practice the art of painting, which is the art of color, we must, of course, use materials for our paints and be aware of their properties, how to mix them, and so on. Here we come upon a significant question which is really left unanswered by the customary knowledge of the time, namely, how is color, which we have learned to know as constantly in movement, whether image or luster, related to matter and material objects? What makes matter appear colored? Anyone who has looked into Goethe's title Theory of Color and readers aside, that is on this website as a free download, end of readers aside, will probably know that out of a certain intellectual honesty, he never really dealt with this question, because he realized that with the means at his disposal, he could not get to the heart of the problem. How is color attached to solid matter? Yet this question is highly relevant to art and painting, for painting is, to all appearance, concerned with just this phenomenon. We apply the color and try to evoke an impression with it. So it is at this point when we want to apply our investigations into the nature of color to the art of painting that we become interested in the appearance of color in matter. Since physicists have in recent times regarded the theory of color as a part of optics, we find explanations of the nature of color in material objects worthy of recent physics. We find, for example, the characteristic explanation of the question, why is an object red? It is red because it absorbs all the other colors and reflects only red. This is an explanation characteristic of recent physics, for it is based more or less on the kind of logic which says, why is a man stupid? Fundamentally, he is stupid because he has absorbed a great deal of cleverness and radiates only stupidity. If one turns this logical principle, so common in color theory, to the rest of life, you see what interesting results can occur. As we have already remarked, Goethe was more honest about this question. He followed the problem as far as the means at his disposal allowed. Then he came to a halt, as it were, in face of the question, how does matter become colored? You will recall how we first came upon the image character of the first four colors we dealt with. We saw how it was a question of one form of existence producing its shadow or image in another. We saw how green arises when the living appears as image in the lifeless. And then, how peach blossom color arises when the soul appears as image in the living. We saw also how white arises when the spiritual forms its image in the soul. And finally, how black arises when the lifeless forms its image in the spiritual. There we have all the colors which have the character of image. The rest have the character of luster. In the external world, green is the most clearly visible expression of this image character. Black and white are, in a certain sense, borderline cases, and for this reason are not generally considered by many to be colors. Peach blossom, we have seen, is really only to be grasped in movement. Thus in green, the image character is most typically portrayed, 
and with it we have the color which is really attached to the external world, in particular to the plant kingdom. In the plant kingdom, therefore, the origin of, in quotes, fixed color as image really becomes apparent. It is now perhaps a question of discovering in the green of plants what is the true quality, the essential nature of green. In doing so, we must go a good deal further with the problem than would normally be considered necessary today. We know from titled Occult Science that the plant kingdom was really formed during the previous metamorphosis of our present earth. But we also know that at that time there was as yet no solid matter. In the plant kingdom, then, we have something which has been formed during the former metamorphosis of the earth and was then transformed during its further evolution. The plants were formed in the fluid conditions of the old moon evolution when there was no solid matter. This fluid state was permeated with flowing color. There was no need for it to be fixed to anything, or at least only to the surface. Only on the surface did the fluid element begin to solidify. So it would be possible to say, looking back to this earlier stage of evolution, that in the formation of the plant we are concerned with an essential fluid condition in which green, as also color generally, existed in flowing movement. And it was only during the earth period of evolution, as you can see from Tidal Occult Science, that the plants were able to take on a firm form and incorporate the mineral element. It became possible for the plant to have a definite and no longer fluctuating nature, so that what we now describe as the plant appears for the first time during earth evolution. Only then could color assume the character which we see in the plant today and appear as fixed green. Green is not the only color usually seen in a plant, which, as we know, in the course of its metamorphosis, takes on other colors. It has yellow, blue or white flowers, or red flowers or fruit, as in the melon, for instance, which is transformed from green into yellow. Quite a superficial observation shows us what happens when the plant takes on a color other than green. When this happens, you can quite easily observe that the appearance of these other colors is connected with the sun, with direct sunlight. Just consider how plants hide themselves and curl up if they cannot hold up their flowers to the sunlight. There is a connection, if only a superficial one, between the sun and certain parts of the plant not being colored green. The sun, as it were, metamorphoses the green. It encroaches upon the green and transforms it. Having related the various, excuse me, having related the varied colors of the plant with a heavenly body, even if only superficially, it will not be a difficult matter to turn to the statements in Tidal Occult Science and ask what its observations reveal about other possible connections between the coloring of plants and the stars. Here we have to ask ourselves, what kind of heavenly body has the strongest effect on earth, working in an opposite way to the sun, to produce in the plant what the sunlight later metamorphoses? negates, as it were, and transforms into other colors, what in fact causes green to arise within the plant kingdom. We will be led to that heavenly body which appears as the polar opposite of the sun, the moon. Spiritual science can establish, I can only touch upon these things today, the connection between the green of the plant and the moon, and also between the other colors and the sun by contrasting the properties of moonlight as opposed to sunlight, and especially by the way that moonlight works within sun darkness. Thus in the plant we have an interplay of sun and moon forces, excuse me, influences. But at the same time we have an explanation 
of why green becomes an image and does not appear luminous in the plant as the other colors do. The other colors in the plant have a shining luster quality. If you observe the colors of flowers with the right kind of feeling, you will see that they shine at you. Compare them with green. It is, in quotes, fixed to the plant. You will see here nothing other than a copy of what you perceive in the cosmos. Sunlight shines. Moonlight is the image of the sunlight. In the same way, the image of light, color as image, appears in the green of the plant. It is through the sun that luster colors appear in the plant. The image color, as something fixed, appears in green. These things cannot be grasped by crude physical ideas. They must be lifted into the realm of feeling and then grasped by a sensitivity permeated by spirit. What is understood in this way is transformed into art. Physics, with its clumsy approach to the world of color, drives every artistic quality from its observations, with the result that the artist has not the least idea what to make of its pronouncements concerning color. But when we look at a plant in such a way that we know that cosmic forces are at work and that sun and moon forces interplay to produce color in the plant, we have the basic elements for understanding how, with plants at least, color is fixed in an object and becomes material. It is due to image and not luster influences from the cosmos that color becomes material. In the plant, green has become an image because the moon has been separated from the earth during the course of earth evolution. In the separation of moon and earth, we must seek the real origin of green in the plant kingdom. The plant is no longer exposed to moon forces coming from within the earth, but receives its image character from the cosmos. In our feelings we comprehend the reciprocal relationships brought about by cosmic influences in the plant. We can therefore appreciate the character of green and the other colors in the plant through our sensitivity and through an artistic feeling for the nature of color. If you study the history of painting, you may find it remarkable that the great painters of earlier periods painted people and human situations, but rarely nature, at least so far as the plant kingdom is concerned. Of course, a superficial explanation for this can be found easily enough. One can explain it by saying that people in earlier times were not used to observing nature and therefore did not paint it. This is a very superficial explanation, but people are easily satisfied with such explanations. Something very different lies behind this. Landscape painting only arises when materialism and an intellectual outlook grip mankind, and an abstract view of life increasingly dominates civilization and culture. Landscape painting is really the product of the last three or four centuries. Only since then have men acquired the cast of soul which makes them capable of painting landscapes. Why? Looking at the paintings of an earlier period, one is struck by their distinctive character. Precisely because we have learned to distinguish, we shall be discussing this in greater detail, between the image and luster character of color, we discover that no such distinction was made by early artists in their paintings. They did not recognize, as we found ourselves impelled to do yesterday, the inner will of the luster colors. They were generally unconcerned that yellow required a dissolving circumference. They were only aware of it when they depicted a more spiritual element, not when they painted the everyday world. Nor had they any concern for what we demanded of blue, a little more so in the case of red. You can see this in certain pictures of Leonardo and others, Titian, for example. But in general, we can say 
that the earlier painters did not make the distinction between image and luster colors. Why? They stood in quite a different relationship to the world of color. They experienced the luster quality of color as image and treated it as image in their paintings. But if one gives an image character to what appears in the world of color as luster, if one turns everything into image, one cannot paint landscapes, which include plants. Why not? If you want to paint a landscape with plants which give an effective impression of life, then you must paint the plants in their individual colors, including green, somewhat darker than they really are. You must make the green or the reds or yellows of different plants generally darker than they are. But then, having made the color darker than it is, and tied it down as image, you must veil the whole picture with a yellowish-white atmosphere. You must envelop the whole in a yellowish-whitish light. Then you can really express the nature of the plant in the right manner. You must paint a luminous veil over the image, introducing a lustrous quality. I must ask you now to look at the whole tendency of modern landscape painting from this point of view, how it has probed ever more deeply into the secret of painting vegetation. The living element cannot be expressed if one just paints plants as they appear outwardly. The image gives no impression of life. This only appears when you paint the plants darker than they are and then pour over them a shining glow of yellowish-white light. Because the old masters did not cultivate this glowing quality in their art, this painting of light-filled air, landscape was generally beyond their reach. It is interesting to note, especially toward the end of the 19th century, how artists attempted to master landscape by painting out of doors and in other ways. It can only be mastered when the individual colors of plants are painted darker and a gleaming veil of yellowish-white is then drawn over them. Of course, this must be done in such a way as to meet the requirements of color composition. Then you will be able to paint, on canvas or any other surface, a real impression of life. It is a question of the right feeling, a feeling which leads on to paint with what floods shining from the cosmos and pours as luster over the earth. Only in this way can you enter the secret of the living world of plants and of nature. From this you will realize that everything which we seek to achieve in painting must be found in the nature of color itself. What is the painter's medium in the last analysis? He has to have a surface of canvas, paper or other material on which to fix the picture he is creating. But if his subject, like the living plant, will not allow itself to be fixed pictorially, then at least a lustrous, shining quality should be poured out over it. We have not yet dealt with the variously colored minerals, the lifeless substances. With these particularly we will have to gain an understanding through feeling. The realm of color cannot be conquered by intellect. It must be grasped through feeling. But now we have to consider the question when we paint something inorganic, such as a wall or other lifeless object. Is it really necessary to understand what we paint in terms of color itself? It must be so. Just consider how some things are bearable and some are not. A black table painted against a white surface is quite bearable, is it not? But if I were to paint a blue table, just imagine a painting of a room full of blue furniture. If you have any artistic feeling, you would find it unbearable. Equally impossible is a picture of a room with yellow or red furniture. You could paint a black table on a white background. It would only be a drawing, but it could be done. A color can only really be used on canvas or paper to depict something inorganic or lifeless when it has already assumed an image character. We are then led to the question, what do the colors black, white, green and peach blossom bestow upon lifeless objects? 
The color itself should tell us what it is possible to paint. And if we take colors which are already images, we can never render lifeless objects effectively. We merely have the image, and the color is already that. We still cannot call forth the representation of a chair, but only the image of a chair, if we paint it merely in an image color. What then must we do? We must endeavor, when painting something lifeless, to give the image the character of a luster. That is the point. We must give the colors, which have an image character, black, white, green, and peach blossom, an inner luminosity, a luster character. Then what has been enlivened to luster can then be combined with the other lusters, blue, yellow, and red. The image colors must have their image character stripped off and be given a luster character. When painting the inorganic, the painter must always be aware that a certain source of light, a dull source of light, lies within the things themselves. In a sense, he must think of his canvas or paper as such a source of light. He needs this shining light present in the surface on which he paints. When he paints anything lifeless and inorganic, he must never forget that something like a source of light lies behind it and that the surface is in a way transparent and shines out at him. We now arrive at that point in painting when we fix a color to a surface and have to imbue it with the quality of reflected light, of something which shines back to us. Otherwise we merely draw and do not paint. The recent development of mankind demands that we continually strive to create paintings out of color itself. We must continually be attempting to penetrate the essential nature of color, of impelling an image color to take on the character of a luster, to become inwardly shining. Otherwise we shall not be able to create a painting of inanimate nature which will be bearable. If a wall is depicted in a painting, it will not be a wall, but only the image of one, unless the color is made inwardly luminous. We must make the colors shine inwardly. They will then, in a certain sense, become mineralized. For this reason, it would be good to give up painting from the palette, which leads merely to smearing color matter, coloring matter onto a surface and makes it impossible to evoke the inwardly shining quality in the right way. We should try to paint increasingly from pots of liquid paint with color that is liquid and has a flowing, shining quality. Generally speaking, the introduction of the palette has brought an inartistic element into painting. The palette has brought a materialistic form of painting, a failure to understand the true nature of color. For color is never really absorbed by any material body, but lives within it and emanates from it. Therefore, when I put my colors onto a surface, I must make them shine inwardly. You know that we have tried to evoke these light forces in our building by the use of plant colors, through which the inner quality of light may be most easily expressed. Minerals with their various colorings, excuse me, coloring, possess this inner luminosity, as anyone with feeling for such things will recognize. And it is this which must be captured when we paint lifeless objects. When we paint out of the nature of color and not merely by copying the outward form, we become aware of the mineral kingdom in its inner light nature. How does the mineral become inwardly shining? If we take up a mineral, its color is visible because we see it in sunlight. But sunlight is less active in this instance than it is with the plant. In the plant, the sunlight conjures forth the other colors in addition to green. But with colored minerals and lifeless objects generally, it is the sunlight which makes the colors visible, otherwise we see no color, just as in the dark all cats are either gray or black. But the source of the color is, after all, within. Why? How does it get there? We are back once more to the problem from which we started out today. 
When dealing with green in the plant, I found it necessary to point to the exit of the moon as described in my occult science. But now I must indicate other events which have happened in the course of the evolution of the earth. If you follow what is said in occult science about the development of the earth, you will find that the heavenly bodies which surround the earth and belong to its planetary system were once connected with the whole earth. They were expelled in just the same way as the moon. This is, of course, connected with the nature of the sun, but speaking only of the earth, we can regard it as one exodus. And this exodus of the other planets is connected with the intrinsic coloring of lifeless things. Solids have become colored, could become colored, because the earth was freed from those forces which were within it when it was united with the planets. These forces could then work upon the earth from outside, evoking the inner power of the cosmos in the colors of minerals. This is, in fact, what the minerals received from what has left the earth and now acts from the cosmos. We see that the mystery is much more deeply hidden than it was with the green of the plant. But just because it is hidden, we are enabled to penetrate more deeply into its nature, not only into the life of the plants, but right into the lifeless minerals. So in our consideration of the coloring of solid matter we come, I can only briefly mention it here, to something not taken into account at all by present-day physics. We are led to cosmic effects. We cannot understand the coloring of lifeless objects at all if we do not know its connection with what the earth has retained as inner forces through the departure of the other planets from it. We will now have to explain how one mineral or another may be red, for instance, because of the interaction of the earth and one of the planets, say Mars or Mercury. Or how some may be a yellow color because of the interaction of the earth with Jupiter or Venus, and so on. The colors of minerals will always be a riddle so long as the connection between the earth and what lies outside it in the cosmos is not understood. When we approach the living plant, we must not forget how sunlight and moonlight bestow on it the colors which shine from it as luster and the green which becomes fixed to the surface. But if we wish to understand what shines out from the inner nature of material objects, and how the once fluctuating colors of the spectrum have now become set within solid bodies, we must remind ourselves that what is out in the cosmos today was once within the earth, and is the origin of everything on earth which has a fluctuating quality, even if this is to some extent weighed down. We must look outside the earth for the cause of what lies hidden under the mineral surface. That is the essential thing. What is found on the surface of the earth is more readily explicable in earthly terms than that which lies beneath its surface. What lies under the surface within the earth, within solid matter, must be explained by what is outside the earth. Thus the mineral elements of the earth gleam in colors which they have held back from what has left the earth with the planets. And these colors remain under the influence of the corresponding planets out there in the cosmos. That is why when we paint lifeless objects we must, as it were, reach to the light behind the surface, permeating the whole surface with spirit and creating a hidden inner radiance. I could say that we must try to bring what streams down from the planets behind the surface on which we paint the picture if we want to express the reality and not to be a mere copy. Thus, if we are to paint the lifeless, it depends on the colors being impregnated with spirit. But what does that mean? Recall the diagram that I drew for you when I said that black is really the image of the lifeless in the spirit. We made the radiance come from the spirit and let the lifeless be reflected within it. 
And when we color the lifeless, when we transform it to luster, we evoke its essential quality. This is in fact the process which we should follow when we paint inanimate things. The next step is to ascend to the animal kingdom. If you want to introduce animals into your landscape, then you should be aware, this is of course something to be grasped only through feeling, that the colors of the animals will have to be painted somewhat lighter than they really are, and then a pale bluish light spread over them. If you want to paint, shall we say, some red animals, not very often, of course, then you must allow a light bluish shimmer to play over them, and where an animal emerges from the vegetation, you must blend the yellowish shimmer with the bluish, bringing about a transition from the one into the other. This will enable you to paint the animal kingdom without giving merely the impression of a lifeless copy. We can therefore say, if we paint a lifeless object, it must become luster, shining from within. If a living plant, then it must appear as luster image. We first paint the image color so strongly that we go away from the natural color. We give it the character of an image by painting it somewhat darker and then spread the luster over it, luster image. If we paint animals or ensouled beings, however, we must paint the color as image luster, but without going so far as to make it completely image. This can be achieved by painting more lightly and transforming the image into luster, although in doing so we introduce something that to some extent obscures its pure transparency. In this way we get an image luster effect. If we now go on to what is endowed with spirit, to the human being, we must aspire to paint in pure image color. Here's a little chart. The mineral lifeless, luster. The plant living, luster image. Animal ensouled, image luster. Man spiritual, image. Painters working before the era of landscape painting, painted in just that way. They worked in the pure image color. Here we come to the unmixed image. This means that these colors, which we have learned to know as lusters, must now be grasped as image colors. This is so because when we come to man, we need in a sense to take the luster quality from the colors and to treat them as images. Normally, when we brush yellow over the surface of our picture, we feel we must do so in a certain way. The yellow insists on being frayed out, as it were, and washed away at the edges. Yellow will not have it otherwise. If we paint human beings, however, we find we can ignore the color's real nature and transform it into image. When we change luster into image in this way, we approach the human and we need not worry about anything but the pure transparency of the medium when we paint human beings. Above all, one needs to develop a feeling for the change that takes place in a color when it is transformed into image. Indeed, the whole nature of color, in so far as this is expressed in painting, becomes accessible if one develops a sensitivity for the difference between image and luster. The quality of the image color approaches more nearly to the nature of thought, and the further we penetrate into the image quality, the closer we come to thought. When we paint a human being, we can, in reality, only paint our thoughts about him, but these thoughts must be clearly expressed. They must be expressed in the color. And one lives in the color if one can say, for example, when painting a yellow surface, it ought really to be frayed out at the edges. But as I am transforming it into image, I must also modify it where it touches the other colors. I must apologize in my picture, as it were, for not yielding to the will of yellow. From this you can see that it is quite possible to find a way of painting out of the color. 
It is also possible to regard color as something which accompanies the course of the earth's evolution in such a way that at first it irradiates the earth as luster from the cosmos. Then, when the elements which were within the earth were withdrawn and began to shine back from outside, color became incorporated into material objects. By learning to experience color in this way, by experiencing the cosmic in color, we are able to live truly in color itself. Living in color means that I let the paint dissolve in my paint pot and only when I have dipped my brush in it and spread it over the surface do I allow it to become fixed. But when I use a palette and mix the colors together on it, where they already have a material quality, and then daub them on the surface, I am not really living in color. I do not then live in color, but outside it. I live in color when I have to translate it from a liquid condition to a solid one. I can then experience to a certain extent how color has evolved from the old moon stage of evolution to that of the earth, where it first became fixed. What is fixed can only exist upon the earth. In this way we gain a relationship to color. My soul must live with the color. I must rejoice with yellow, feel the seriousness and dignity of red. I must share with blue its soft, I might also say, tearful mood. I must spiritualize the color if I am to transform it into inner capacities. Without such a spiritual understanding of color, I ought not to paint, and especially not the lifeless mineral kingdom. This does not mean that one should paint symbolically in a quite inartistic way. This color must not be treated as if it signified anything other than itself. It must be handled so that one can live within it. When the palette was substituted for the paint pot, a real living color ceased, and it is because of this that we have all those portraits which look like tailor's dummies. They are puppets, tailor's, pu tailor's dummies, and the like. None of them is real or inwardly alive. Living portraits can only be painted when one really knows how to live with color. These, then, are the suggestions which I wanted to give you in these three lectures. They could naturally be expanded endlessly, and this will be done at some future opportunity. For the present I have tried to make these few suggestions which will serve as an introduction to further studies. It is often said that artists have a natural fear of anything scientific, and that they refuse to let scientific knowledge interfere with their art. Although Goethe could not explain the inner cause of color as it appears in matter, Nevertheless, he provided the basis for an understanding. No one could have spoken more truly than he regarding the painter's fear of the theoretical when he said, quote, So far there has always been found in painters a fear, indeed a specific denial, of all theoretical studies of color and everything to do with it, for which one could not reproach them, since hitherto the so-called theories were groundless, vacillating, and tending toward empiricism. We should like our efforts to do something to calm this fear and to stimulate artists to experience and put to practice proof the laws we have set down. Excuse me, and put to practical proof the laws we have set down. Close quote. If we go about it in the right way, our knowledge need not remain abstract, but can be made concrete in art, and especially so in such an ever-changing medium as color. It is only through the decadence of our science that the artist, quite rightly, has such a fear of theories, which have a purely materialistic and intellectual basis, particularly as we encounter them in modern optics. Just because color is such an ever-changing element it is most desirable that the painter does not allow his color to solidify on the palette, as he usually does today, but keeps it fluid in the pot. 
It is just running away from the issue, however. When the physicist comes along and draws his lines on the board and tries to explain yellow or violet by means of these lines, this does not really belong to physics. Physics is only concerned with light in space, but color, color can only be studied properly by taking into account the realm of soul. For it is sheer nonsense to say that color is merely subjective. And if one goes on to maintain that there is some objective cause outside which works upon us, upon our I, capital, this is nonsense and implies an inadequate conception of the I, capital I. The I itself is within the color. The human eye and astral body are not to be separated at all from color. They live in color and inasmuch as they are united with the color, they have an existence outside the physical body. It is the eye and the astral body which reproduce color in the physical and etheric bodies. That is the point. The whole notion of there being an objective element in color which has an effect upon a subjective element is thus nonsense. For the eye and the astral body are within the color anyway and enter with the color. Color actually bears the eye and astral body into the physical and etheric bodies. The whole conception must simply be turned upside down if one is to penetrate to reality. Everything which has thus found its way into physics and been narrowed down into lines and diagrams must be released again. It would be a good idea if for a while the drawing of diagrams were barred from physics when color is spoken of and the attempt made to grasp the ever-changing movement and life of color. That is what really counts. Then one can get right away from theory and reach the artistic. Then one can fashion a method of studying color which the painter will be able to understand because in uniting himself with and living in such a method, he will discover that it is not theoretical at all, but intimately bound up with color. And when he really lives in color, the color will itself be able to answer his question about the way in which it should be applied. It means that we should try to have a conversation with the colors so that they themselves shall say how they wish to be on the surface of the picture. A method of observation which seeks to be realistic leads inevitably into the art sphere of art but the science of physics has ruined this method for us. Therefore, it must be said with all emphasis that these things which belong primarily to psychology or aesthetics should not be further distorted by a physical way of thinking, but really need quite a different kind of observation. In Gertianism, we find a way of knowledge which embraces the realm of soul and spirit, but which needs to be developed further Goethe, for example, was not able to reach the distinction between the image and luster colors. We must follow Goethe's approach in a living way in our thinking so that we can continually go further. This can only be done through spiritual science.